No, no, we can also listen to it later if we. If anyone joined late, we're just putting our um, names and organizations into the chat. All right, do you think we should go ahead and start? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody, for um, attending the meeting. I'm Laura Barkusen from Open Lands, and I am chairing the CWA Healthy Waters Group. And I have a PowerPoint, actually, that I'm going to share to help us walk through the discussion. I think there's really a lot of things um, to understand and kind of gain common knowledge of. And I'm hoping that we can do that in this meeting and then um, move on from there. Let me share. Can everyone see this? Yes. Okay, great. See if I can get it to go. There we go, into mode. So the goals um, for our discussion today, I was gonna go over first. And then we can introduce ourselves. Um, so the Healthy Waters Group has been tasked with creating or adopting an index that can measure waterway health. So that's our, um, our challenge. And um, to consider what impacts, what, what, the, what does impact waterway health and how it can be measured. And also, to consider whether we're going to adopt the United States Environmental Protection Agency's Healthy Water Shed Index. And finally, to really start thinking about how, we're, how would we use an index and what are the important projects that the index would inform. So this is really kind of the work that we have to do this year that we're going to start talking about today. Yeah, and then I thought we could do introductions um, of just name, organization, and whether you've participated in the CWA Healthy Waters group before. Um, so I'll start. I'm Laura Barkusen from Open Lands, and I have participated in this group before. I'm new as chair, but I've been at several of the earlier meetings. I'll go next. I'm Laura Riley. I'm the coordinator of Chicago Wilderness Alliance, and I'll pass it to Victoria Wittig. Thank you, Laura and Laura. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I am the Northwest Indiana Urban Waters Partnership Ambassador and also on the Chicago Wilderness Alliance Steering Committee and have been in conversations with Laura, the Lauras um, about how this initiative team um, will uh, move forward. So looking forward to the discussion. And I will hand it over to Ted. 
Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ted Hafner. Uh, I'm not with an organization per se. I'm unaffiliated, but I and I haven't participated in this group before, but I am the lead for the Climate Initiative of Chicago Wilderness. So I'm here for coordination purposes. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, let's go to uh, Susan Mahalo. Did I get that right? Close. Susan Mahalo, and I'm with the Nature Conservancy in Indiana, Southern Lake Michigan Room Project Office, and I am very new to this in terms of uh, this particular project. About I'm Andrew Calkins. Oh, oh, yeah, great. Let's go ahead. Andrew. Lost my video. All right, I'm Andrew Hawkins with the Forest Preserve District of Will County. Um, this is my first time attending this group and I don't know why I keep losing my video. There. Thanks, Andrew. And Thanks. pass it along to Victoria. Oh, I've already had an opportunity to introduce myself, so I will hand it oh, on over sorry. to Harshini. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Harshini Ratnayaka. I'm the advocacy coordinator for Save the Dunes. I am quite new to this organization or like this particular uh, uh, group, but I'm happy to be here and thanks for having me. And I will pass it over to my executive director, Betsy. Hi, everyone. I'll turn on my video for just a second here. Um, I am Betsy. Uh, I'm also a Save the Dunes. Hershini is more the point person than me, but I was very interested in this topic. So I thought I'd hop on and listen for a little bit. Um, and I will, has Lindsay gone? Pass it to Lindsay. Lindsay Burt. Sorry about that. I hadn't gone yet. Let me put my camera on. so. You all can see me for a second. The lighting's probably not good. Um, I'm traveling. So my name is Dr. Lindsay Burt. I'm the Client Solutions Manager for Xyla. My PhD was at Purdue where I looked at um, watershed management. And uh, years ago, I was on the corporate council for Chicago Wilderness. I was also on uh, Lake County Forest, Pre Forest Preserve Strategic Planning Committee. I was on the committee for CMAP, Environmental Natural Resources. I'm not quite sure why I'm here, but you could tell uh, I do have experiences in um, conservation, water, environmental. I'm currently doing digital water, so looking at sensor technology and digital technology to um, optimize and distribute and clean our water um, from source to watershed and have had also a lot of experience in GIS mapping. So I don't know if any of that rings a bell to anyone, but thank you for having me and I'll just be listening in. Thank you. I see Phil Willing. Uh, yeah, uh, Philip Willing, Illinois Natural History Survey, uh, have participated in various versions of this group for a while. Oh, somebody next. Let's see here. Durs. I see Durs Anderson. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Phil. And hi, Lindsay. Good to see you again. Been a while. Uh, Durs Anderson, I worked with Laura on stream issues, stream and uh, river issues for many years at Open Lands. Um, let's see, I'll turn it over to Gabe Powers. Gabe Powers with McHenry County Conservation District. And I think this is my second or third time attending this group. Next on my screen is, screen is Lake. Hi, I'm Lake. I am the intern for Chicago Wilderness. So I am taking the minutes today, but it's lovely to meet you all. And I can pass it over to um has susan gone hi i'll turn on my camera for a second i'm susan thomas i'm with just transition northwest indiana and i have attended uh one of these meetings before and i was so 
intrigued and impressed that um, I'm back for more. So thank you so much for the invite. I will hand it to, let's see, um, Mark Johnston, have you gone yet? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, so Mark Johnson, I'm with the Field Museum. I've been there about 12 years. I'm a GIS, uh, lead GIS analyst. Um, I work primarily on CW Hub on that platform. And um, I have attended before, although it's been a while. And let's see, I'll turn over to, I don't know who hasn't gone, um, Andrew Hawkins, maybe? How about Cody? Andrew, we just went. Okay. Sorry. Cody. Hey everyone, uh, Cody Eskew here. I'm with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources Coastal Management Program, um, and I have not participated in this group before, but um, very interested. Uh, the Coastal Management Program, we, we we kind of partner with a lot of people that have uh, you know, some stakeholders in the coastal management zone, um, and we're always looking for potential projects to partner and fund on, especially now that there's uh, a wave of funding sort of coming through, especially in the federal level. So I'm um, definitely interested to see what kind of work this, this group is going to be producing in the future. And has Beth, Beth Byer, have you gone? Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Beth Byer uh, with the Technology Alliance nonprofit. I've mostly been active with CWA with the, uh, with the Climate Action Group. Um, but I'm very interested in learning more about protecting healthy water. So this is my first time today. I look forward to learning more. And there was some discussion about more about how the water and the hub were interacting. So I'm looking forward to hearing about that if that's something that we covered today. Thanks. So let me see who's here. It hasn't gone yet. Um, someone by the name of Justin Vick. Hi guys. Uh, hello. Hello. Hi. Hey. All right. Uh, yeah, my name is Justin Vick. I'm an aquatic biologist for MWRD. Um, I don't think I've been involved in these groups, but I am curious if the charge is to create an index to assess the health of the streams. There are. I just wanted to say there are existing indexes, which you probably know about, that are for, you could use fish populations or macroinvertebrates. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. And we're going to be looking at one that like integrates a whole lot of information into it. Um, but yes. Yes. How about uh, Leslie? Um. Leslie Thompson from Illinois Indiana Sea Grant and Purdue University Northwest in Hammond. And this is my maybe fourth meeting for this group. Just and um, so I look forward to hearing how we proceed. Jim? Uh, I'm Jim Anderson. I'm currently with Citizens for Conservation, but I also sit on the steering committee and uh, very interested in this aquatics group and uh, trying to, you know, think about this index. Um, I think getting it decided and, and moving on to the next thing that uh, we should be thinking at is a, a good task for us. Great, did we get everybody? Is there anyone who hasn't introduced themselves? Okay, I think we've got everyone. So I am going to move on here. Let's see. Uh oh. Got this. Okay. There we go. Um, so for protecting healthy watersheds, one thing the group has done in the past is really thought about what are our watershed health priorities um, in the Chicago wilderness region. What do we want to look at to see what kind of watershed health we have? Oh, sorry. And um, we've got the, the things that the group has come up with in the past for watershed health priorities were connectivity in terms of improving connectivity of water so people and wildlife can travel and thrive, 
uh, physical integrity of waterways, including shorelines, river banks, in-stream habitat, um, and a host of other uh, indicators. And then also health, including the health of humans and native aquatic life, um, health of ground and surface water, and um, habitat, and also controlling invasive species. Um, resilience, which was defined as humans and aquatic life adapting to climate change impacts and fluctuating lake levels, and source protection, so like protection of headwater streams, um, fens, springs, wetlands, connected uplands, and then what uh, was called restored absorption, meaning nature-based solutions, including restoration, increased storage and infiltration. So this is what, um, this reflects the past work of this committee and what they thought was important to watershed health. And um, after coming up with these uh, important, um, these important uh, things for watershed health, the group also thought about what, um, what indicators exist out there that could be used to measure how, um, how much connectivity we do have, how much physical integrity we do have, and et, et cetera. And so this is really the spreadsheet of all the things that they thought we could use to measure the health of those indicators. And so it's kind of a long list there, but I just wanted to show it to you because people, you know, they really put a lot of thought into what do we have that can help us be informed about, um, about each thing that we thought was important. Um, and um, the other thing that we have been thinking about and considering is whether we can use US EPA's Protecting Healthy Watersheds Index, um, which has been created by the EPA. They call it um, preliminary because in many cases, users will customize it in some way to be more helpful to their projects. And uh, Mark Johnston has put the um, Healthy Watershed Index up on the pools portion of the hub for this project. And so we're looking at it here in terms of the Chicago Wilderness Watersheds. And so all the little lines that you can see in there, um, define small watersheds or what we call Huck 12, which is, you know, one of the, I think maybe the finest resolution that we have. And then um, the shading indicates how the US EPA Healthy Watershed Index has actually, um, has kind of, you know, rated that watershed with the deeper colors being higher health. And so that is what um, the Healthy Watershed Index looks like for the Chicago Wilderness Region. One of the reasons that we were really interested in looking at this index is because it is, it is regional. And it, um, so we're not looking at different data layers for different states. You know, it does cover our entire Chicago wilderness region um, in order to give us a, you know, sort of coherent and comparable across watersheds index. And what the um, healthy watersheds assessment framework, so these are sort of the inputs into that index. It looks at landscape condition in terms of you know, patterns of natural land cover um, and um, natural disturbance regimes, lateral and longitudinal conductivity of the aquatic environment and continuity of landscape processes. It looks at habitat 
including aquatic wetland, riparian floodplain, lake and shoreline habitat, and hydrologic connectivity. And then it looks at um, hydrology and geomorphology, water quality, and biological condition. Um, and one thing that I thought would be interesting to do was to look at the priorities that this uh, Healthy Waters Group has come up with in the past um, as important things to measure. And so I just looked at one of the, um, one of the columns that I showed you before, <clears throat> which was the connectivity column. And over on the, um, on the left-hand side, you can see all the things that the group in the past thought that we could measure to understand where we're at with waterway connectivity. And I looked at the Healthy Watershed Index and tried to kind of crosswalk it and see, well, do I think that there are indicators in here that um, might you know, be somewhat equivalent to the things that the group had indicated were important to measure? Um, and so in many cases, I thought there were, uh, there were things in the Healthy Watersheds model that would help us understand these important metrics. Um, for example, uh, in dam mapping was one of the things that was suggested. And the Healthy Watershed model does have inputs like ratio of dam storage volume to pre-development annual stream flow at the outlet and dam density in terms of counts of dams per stream kilometer. Um, and then there were some things that the group identified in the past that I really felt were not, you know, present in the Healthy Watersheds model and I put the, or index, and I put them in yellow here. Like for example, um, IDOT culvert data, which would just be relevant to Illinois. So it's kind of a more localized thing. And then um, things like boat launches. So in terms of what it seems like is missing um, from the conductivity category, at least, would be indicators of things that connect people to water trails, um, like trails and uh, public spaces and boat launches, and then things that come from what I thought were more local data sets, like the IDOT uh, culvert data that would just be um, relevant to Illinois. And so uh, at this point, I thought it might be helpful to look at the hub tools. And I'm super excited that Mark Johnston is here <laughs> um, for the Healthy Water pages. So I'm going to see if I can click on this and get it to come up. Can you all see this drawing, the map? No, I, you may have to. Um... Uh, I'm going to reshare. Yeah. Can you see it now? Yes. OK, great. Um, so this is uh, on the Chicago Wilderness Alliance hub. And the background that you're seeing here is the watershed shading from the Healthy Watersheds model and then or index. And then you can see there are other things here too, because some of the things that we might want to see that are not included in that model, you know, could be included as overlays or may be included as overlays. And if you click on um, the layer list here, you can see um, you know, the different layers that are in here, like the Chicago Wilderness Counties, the Illinois Biological Stream Ratings, watershed boundaries at different scales. So if you want to see larger areas, um, you can look at them as well. Um, and wetlands. And there's also, as I was looking at this, I realize you can click on 
this little add data button. And then you get a whole host of things that you can add, um, including protected lands, Illinois natural inventory sites, uh, soil attributes. There's a really a lot of things here that you can add. Mark, is there anything else that you think is important for people to see here that I haven't? Um, I think that's that's a great overview. And there's also in the top right, there's just a legend, you know, so that you can, yeah, that one will sort of show you what you're currently looking at. Right, now I seem to have made a lot of things pop up. <laughs> I, get, I get them to disappear so we can see. Okay, there we go. So there's a legend. Um, and something that I thought was really interesting about this is if you look at, let me just put the legend back and open this. I'm just for the moment going to turn off everything except the healthy watershed index, the US EPA index. So if you look at the US EPA index and you want to learn more about one of these little watersheds, I'm going to click on one. And indicators that went into the rating for that watershed will pop up, um, like the percent of land. Oh, wait, not that one. Let's see. Um, Okay, so for example, if you want to see the percent grassland in the watershed, and then it gives the year that that's from. Uh, so there's a number of categories that you can look at, count of at-risk aquatic species, et cetera. And these are all indicators that went into rating that watershed the way it is rated. And um, in talking to one of the people who developed this index, he was making the point that um, this index is good for comparing watersheds to each other. It's less useful for looking at how any single watershed changes over time. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. Um, and yeah, so, um, and this is something that you can definitely explore. I'm gonna go back to, let's see, the other um, PowerPoint. Let's see where we are. Okay, so we have looked at the hub tools. Um, yeah, and this um, I put up just to show these are the like the scores that the watershed got um, and how that's associated with colors. And this you know takes into account the indicators and any weights given to them. So after having looked at that. Um, and going forward, I think some of the questions that we need to think about are um, how an index could inform, you know, the work of partners. And so as an example, I was thinking about um, for open lands, perhaps we could use an index like this to help us prioritize land acquisition in Hackmatack Wildlife Refuge area. Um, and then I was thinking about, you know, could the Healthy Watershed Index as it is on the hub be used for this. And then I basically thought, you know, it would be, we would need an overlay of the Hackmatack boundaries. And, um, and we might wanna prioritize the watersheds within the boundary by comparing them only to each other instead of to the whole Chicago wilderness region. Um, so those might be ways that it could be sort of customized 
if we were going to use it for a project like that. Um, and then I think the second question to think about is um, how could an index inform uh, Chicago um, Wilderness Alliance regional priorities? And as an example, I kind of thought of could it be used to inform policy work? And when I was looking at the Healthy Watershed Index map for the first time, I was trying to look at where the South Suburban Airport would be and, um, and noted that it looked like it would overlap with a, you know, a watershed here that's coming out as fairly healthy comparatively in the region. So I thought that might be one way that it could be used, but really I want to sort of open up the floor to everybody in terms of what you all think of these questions. Um, in terms there was of a question from, or a comment question from Mila Marshall, who actually had to step off, but um, she said, we track all water permits in the state of Illinois and have the locations of all the wetlands that uh, ACOE has approved to be drained, as well as access to uh, the Army Corps of Engineer Ribbit system that tracks wetland banks for water quality trading credits. Can these maps be exported into QGIS or ArcGIS for further analysis, for example? Yeah, and um, Mark, could we, you know, if we wanted to actually put that onto the hub so that we could see it with the model, would that be possible or with the index? Yeah, sorry, what was the data format? I think you were saying, um, was it QGIS or something that they're using for those data sets? But so is it, was, it was part of the Army Corps of Engineer Ribbit system and wondering if they could be mm -hmm. exported into QGIS or ArcGIS for further analysis. Yeah, so I mean, as long as we can get the spatial data, which I would imagine we can, um, then it can be uploaded either by me or any one of us, really. You can go into through the main page, create a free account if you don't have one already, and do an upload. And you kind of include all the information about the data set that you're uploading, where you got it from, and there's a variety of formats for uploading. And then that plus button that you were talking about earlier, Laura, um, on the interactive map, Mm -hmm. You can click that, and once the data set's approved, it'll show up there as a as another overlay. So those are all pulling from the repository. So I, I think the question mark was: Do you think that the data that US EPA has is downloadable to someone at, at their workstation? <clears throat> uh, oh, is that the question? Yeah, um, I, I think that was that was the you know she wants to be able to use it in a you know probably on her. You know, and I don't, I don't recall, I know there's a way that you can um, look at your watershed and, and put information in and change the, the thing to make it more specific, but I don't know if the, if US EPA's data is downloadable to a person. Yeah, see. I'm, I'm pretty certain it is. Um, I'm trying okay. to look right now as I'm, but um, you just go into the repository and look for the title. Um, if it's not shared, we can share it, but it should be in there. Unless I removed it just because it felt redundant with you know popping up on that add data, but I believe it's downloadable. I believe it's downloadable as well. In fact, um, I was kind of on the verge of downloading it when I realized that Mark has posted it on um, the hub. Oh uh, yeah, it's certainly downloadable from from um, EPA uh, themselves, but I think it's downloadable from Hub as well. Is what I was. So um, yeah, so maybe one thing that um, we could do after this meeting is uh, maybe look at that and send out some instructions. I can look at that, Mark, and let you know if I have questions. Okay. Yeah, and then I guess the other question with that is um, whether it would we be whether it would be worth um, customizing the data set in any way 
for that particular project, one of the things that I was really struck with at the cafe was how um, Wisconsin DNR had customized the index, um, particularly how they had, you know, looked at a smaller area than the entire state. And in our case, that would be like, if, if we wanted to look at a smaller area than the entire Chicago wilderness region, like that example I gave with Hackmatack, you know, if we would want to compare watersheds within a smaller geography um, to prioritize them in some way uh, within, you know, Hackmatack or maybe within the Chicago River watershed or um, in some other way. So in terms of the uh, in terms of the location of the wetlands, you know, one thing that could be thought about is how, you know, is there a way that we could customize or would want to customize the index or would it just really be an overlay? Um, yeah, I mean, I think you could, if, if you want to work with like subset areas like that, I mean, you can always zoom in on the map and look at it. But if you want to do like a comparison just within like, let's say Hakim Attack, like you said, probably that, that's kind of a gis -y sort of thing that if someone wants to like download the data and work with it in Pro or in QGIS, they could do that. And they could even like create a you know, a PDF or even an interactive map of their own and upload it back to Hub again, uh, you know, if they want to have like one specific to that region to share with other people. And there's even like a ability to like make comments on maps and to like circle things um, on the map. I could show that um, if you. Yeah, I'll stop that. sharing. What's up? I'll stop sharing if you wanted to show. Oh, uh, okay. Um, yeah, I'll just really briefly. Um, so this is, I was about to send you the link to this. This is that um, data set that you're asking about, the Watershed EPA Eco Region, where you can download it. Um, you can see the way that it displays it is just sh showing everything in the same, same color here. So it's not useful to look at it on here per se, um, but this is where you can download it. Um, and if you're a savvy sort of ArcGIS Pro user, you can actually link directly to the data on the on on the, sort of on the back end um, and work with the data directly from Hub um, in your system. But um, <clears throat> what I was saying before, like you can kind of create these like conversations. Um, this isn't a good example because this is just a data set rather than a map. But I could come in here and like create a post and you can even like circle things on the map and say, you know, zooming into like a certain region and want to say something about it and, and other people can kind of comment back on it. So that's that's all accessed. Let me go back to where I started here. So if you go to the main page um, and you scroll down, the data repository is right here. And this will give you the data repository to everything in the um, in the hub, but there's also a sort of a, a filtered version of that that you get on the protected lands, um, protected uh, water. Sorry, healthy water. Um, so if you go to tools, um, and then it's got this data repository button right here. So they they both are showing kind of the same thing. It's just one's been filtered to the Healthy Waters data set. And then let's see if you just type in like EPA, here it is, Eco Region. That's that one that you were just asking about, like, can it be downloaded to, to work with it? So here it's popping up again. Great, thank you. Yeah. Good. So it could just be like, so going back to that hack attack example, if we downloaded this data set and then just um, like clipped it to the Hackmatack region, we could just then reshade it to see how those watersheds compared to each other. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question for Mark. Is, is one of the data sets that's been downloaded, the Illinois River Watch data, as well as Wisconsin and Indiana's River Watch? 
Um, I'm not super familiar. I don't remember offhand if that. Um, I, I don't think so. There's, I, I know what you're talking about, and I don't think that's been included in the uh, EPA watershed index. Now that might be that might be something that we share with Mark, and he puts on the Healthy Waters page, and you know so that we you know when Laura was showing you the different layers that you can pull up, then we might be able to pull that information up. <clears throat> good, good. Yeah, yeah. I think that's one important thing for us to think about. What else do we want to see up on that page? You know that would allow us better to use um, the the information to really inform our projects and look at the things we want to see. Yeah, and, and keep in mind, like uh, folks can upload their own data sets if they want to the system. It does get reviewed, so um, someone will look at it, probably me, um, to make sure that it like, because because if you upload a GIS data set, it might look like what, what you saw as the download there where it's not been stylized yet. So we need to like stylize it before we publish it to make it accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, you would just do that in the same place that on that main page, if you're logged in, you'll see there's like a upload button there where you can, I can show that if you want. Yeah, the, the other thing you said, I think that would be important um, is, you know, what we don't know is really uh, the quality of our first and second order streams in each of these HUC 12 watersheds. Uh, however, you know, they're like McHenry County Conservation District and uh, some other agencies slowly have been doing biological inventories of the headwaters. Um, so if we we're able to create some type of page uh, connection or whatever that um, identifies you know, which which of the headwater streams within the Huck, or even which of the Huck 12 watersheds even have headwater stream data sets that would be valuable, I think. It's going to take many, many years to do them all, but uh, we may as well start. Yeah, and I wonder, Durs, if we could just um, like upload our headwater streams maps that Craig has worked on, and then it would just be you know, a question of displaying it over the watershed, at least to see whether or not there are headwater streams in there. Yeah, so there, there's lots of layers that we should think about. Um, you know, I think, uh, Bill, you might be able to tell us about, I think the IDNR and Natural History Survey did pool water streams. They did a, a survey of that. They've done mussels. And I think both Wisconsin and Indiana probably have done those. So those are like, um, regional data sets that we may want to add to, I, I think we can add it to the healthy index, but the index is like a, a you know, it's a great uh, palette to start from. And, you know, if you look through the index and you, you know, if you're familiar with the area and you look at the streams, they, they've got it very, you know, it's not perfect, but it's really pretty good as far as looking at which ones are healthy and which ones are vulnerable. And, you know, all these things are great questions and data that we can add. So I think that's, uh, I think coming up with a list of, of good data sets that are regional, that, but we also want to make sure that they're uh, repeatable and someone's uh, doing them on like, like a five-year period, which is typically what the state does. And then I, I know the Natural History Survey, they do studies all the time. And so looking at what data sets are out there to add to this is, is really a key key point and finding out what Indiana and Wisconsin and Michigan have. Um, just a question, Darius, you were, you were saying, um, is the Illinois Water Watch data included in here? And, and is that different than what the Illinois Biological Stream ratings would be? Those? Yeah, those Illinois schools? River Watch is uh, citizen-based science. Oh, uh, okay. All that. And that's the same in Wisconsin and Indiana, that, you know, all the states do it. And that gets a bit more granular than this this um, DNR. Yeah, it's, it's it's certainly just in weightable streams. Uh, you know, where it's mostly macro invertebrate in, indexes. Cool. I suspect they'd be willing to share their data if you reach out to them. They they want people to use them as a resource. So. Mm -hmm. And if you can't find their contact, let us know, and we can 
point you. I thought Ted had his hand raised earlier. Do you still have a question? Yeah, I, I do. And it's been circling around in my head. Um, I'm wondering, especially with the EPA maps, uh, I get that you can compare watersheds. I get that it's not a great tool to see watershed progress in terms of elevating conditions. Um, one of the questions is, I saw all the indicators that you can click on, right? The data indicators when you click on a layer. How many of those do we know have, uh, might be outside of like biological indicators into more cultural type indicators as an assessment of, you know, ordinances, regulations, uh, pollution, um, inflows, that kind of stuff. Do we have, is that type of data included or would it help to understand those kind of factors as part of this discussion and indicator um, assessment? Yeah, and I would say that some of that kind of data is included and I don't actually have a, very, a really comprehensive idea off the top of my head of what's in there, but I can show you, I'm gonna, is that, let's see, here we go. I'm gonna go back to when I was looking here. Yeah, okay, so the types of things that I was seeing in there were things like um, human population density in the riparian zone. Um, human population density in the whole um, watershed, the density of roads in the riparian zone. Um, let's see. Uh, and there was, yeah, for, wet, for wetlands, I thought it might be interesting to look at like a percent of the um, watershed drained by artificial ditches. Uh, percentage um, of the watershed with agriculture in hydric soils. And let's see, oh yeah. And then there was things like percentage of the watershed with impaired waters, the count of unique impairment causes in the watershed. So I think that's more like what you were asking about, Ted. Um, the count of coal mines in the watershed, uh, percent of impervious and density of road crossings. So yeah, it looks like they have infrastructure stuff in there, which is certainly cultural and can contribute to degraded quality. But I, I don't see any like socio-demographic stuff like policies or municipal right policies or stormwater policies that might contribute to a watershed that shares a county boundary, right? Right, I think that that's not in there. Okay. Uh, some of the links that are in the agenda, you know, will actually allow you to look at the metadata and see what's in there. But right. I don't think that was in there. Thank and you. Interesting thing that is in there is like vulnerability assessments of hmm. watershed and things had been looked at like, like change in, let's say, um, forest cover in the watershed between 2001 and 2010. Ooh. Things like that. And then also um, some kind of vulnerability assessment in terms of from now to 2050, you know, what they expected to see um, for certain things. And that's something that I think we need to look at more carefully. But I thought that kind of, you know, that whole thing that they were, I think, titling the vulnerability assessment might be interesting um, for thinking about climate change impacts, you know, and resilient versus vulnerable watersheds. This is pain. So yeah, thank you, Laura. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I would definitely encourage you to look at the metadata. And um, yeah, and I think that those links are in the agenda, but I can send a bunch of links again after this meeting. So I dropped, I dropped the link to the running minutes, which, which includes the links from the agenda in it. So anyone can take a look at them there. Okay, great. Um, I might just quickly point out that um, 
you know, as you're saying, like there's a lot of additional data behind all the watershed, you know, looking in, in those attributes, we can, you know, if there's certain ones that are important, we could, you know, add an additional layer that has them symbolized um, by that attribute. But there were so many, I didn't want to, you know, try to do all of them or even do a handful because I wouldn't know which ones to select, but we could certainly do that um, if there's some that you want to call out. Yeah, yeah. so Ted, there's, there's like 300 different indicators that they're using um, for the EPA. And you could actually add um, an indicator to the healthy watershed for your watershed. So, um, <clears throat> or as Mark has done so wonderfully, we can use the, the the watershed index as a background and then use the data sets that he has to compare everything. And so um, I think it, it's, um, you know, these are tools and some of these things that we want to tease out, someone's going to have to do. Yeah, thanks everybody. And that kind of leads me, I know we're running short on time here. Um, but I was thinking about uh, next steps and a, a next step that's occurring to me now that we've had this discussion that I don't really have up here is whether we want to like have a subcommittee around looking at the indices in terms of things that might be interesting to us. Like for example, for the climate change group head, like if it would be worth, if there would be a small group of people who would wanna look at the uh, index and, and discuss that. Cause we could, you know, even begin to form subcommittees like that. Uh, and I was also uh, gonna suggest that we, before the next meeting. So I was thinking this group would meet again in July and again in October, like meet quarterly. And then if, um, and then we can also form subcommittees that would meet between those if we want to. And we can consider projects that could benefit from the index for our next meeting and discuss it. Um, and we could think about funding, like is there funding for projects that we think could benefit from the index or is there funding that we should be going after? You know, if we define what we think are really useful um, projects that comes out of our thinking about this. Um, and so I was gonna ask everyone to please discuss this with your organizations and come back to the next meeting with your thoughts. Um, and then kind of related to what I was saying before, you know, if there's anyone who wants to continue to look at the indices and kind of crosswalk them with what the group had thought was important for watershed health um, in the past, in, in our past meetings of this group, we could do that. Um, and then uh, we thought the co-chairs could meet, you know, to talk about how the other Chicago Wilderness Alliance initiative teams might be able to use the index to inform their work. So these are all things for all of us to think about for the next meeting. Let me see what I have here. Oh yeah. I could add one one other thing that would be great um, that some of the other groups are trying to create kind of a dashboard that's indicating numeric values of like how we're doing. Like we could say how many watersheds are above or below some threshold, sort of are in good or poor condition or you know whatever those metrics might be we could do those analyses and have kind of a running dashboard now of course it's only going to update every time this data set updates unless we're using some other data set you know to pull from but something to consider you know like if we were to create a dashboard what would be on it and you know how would we get it to continue to update over time that's a great idea, Mark. And I would also say, <clears throat> you know, we can look at um, sort of, you know, where we're at today, but we also can see, um, are we addressing things that are outlined in like the, like CMAP's uh, plan, uh, sewer plaque, uh, NERPC plans, you know, when they could, there's a whole slew of uh, recommendations for, water and um, 
healthy watersheds in in their plans and we could say how many of those are we addressing or aren't addressing you know which ones have we succeeded at are there some that we succeeded at um and so i i think looking at those those work that's already completed we should see if we are are matching that mm -hmm. hey this is a question for the group well, there's a moment of silence and I know time is tight. Um, in my understanding, this data looks mostly at riverine data, right? Uh, it doesn't address sort of overland flow at all, or does it? Uh, I think, I mean, I think it is pulling stats like percent types of, you know, percent cover of, you know, different land covers and things over within the watershed. So it's looking at what's in the land. But I, I don't know if you're talking sp just specifically about the hydrology across. The it, it's it's looking at potentially restorable wetlands. It's looking at drinking surface water, drinking groundwater, population served. Um, there, you know, I would encourage everybody to get into the play with the map and, and look at the 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 list of indicators because there's a lot of them. Three hundred three is is indicated in there. Um, you know, I, I think it does cover the one thing I, I think we don't have an answer to is uh, Lake Michigan. And and we should be mindful of, of, of this group of thinking about Lake Michigan and how we want to address it. So I don't think, you know, the, the, the index does not address Lake Michigan, but I'm sure there's an index out there for the Great Lakes. But <clears throat> and so that's that's a that's an item that we should think about. And and um, Laura, I don't know if in in your research if you know how frequently this data set gets updated, but we could we could download. This is something we've done for some of the other groups: is downloaded all the older data sets, and then start to do that watershed to watershed comparison over time. You know, so if we're looking at you know going back 10, 15 years, we can sort of see how it's progressed over time, how it's changed. And then that that also might be kind of the stuff we'd want to put on our dashboards. Yeah, I thought that would be super interesting. Um, and I think in my looking at this, that this might have been created in 2017 and updated in 2021, you know, at least for some of the mm -hmm. some of the categories that are covered. Um, the other thing I thought we might want to look at is that um, percent change that they have in there from 2001 to 2010, I think, for some of the uh, some of the measurements that I think would be super important, like, you know, natural land cover in the watershed, etc. Um, I mean, it, there might be a way to sort of analyze which watersheds had changed the most in a negative or a positive way, you know, over that period. And that just that's just one indicator that's in there. And then there's the whole vulnerability um, up to 2050 that I thought might be interesting to look at individually as well to try to pull out, you know, where where do we have a lack of resilience in the region, you know, and is there something we want to try to do around that data? So I saw those two for things that we could look at right now, you know, we wouldn't have to wait for a, for an update because I don't really know when the next one will be. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we want to, let's see what time is it? Oh, uh -oh we're already one minute over. Um, so yeah, I don't know if we want to try to meet in any way before we meet again in July, or if we just want to um, think about uh, things, um, you know, and then come back in July. Uh, if we want to make any subcommittees, we could, I think probably, um, we should reach out to you all by email because I know we're over time already. But thanks everybody for coming and sharing your ideas. This is really, it's really interesting to think about this and what we could do with this. Um, 
Yeah, so we'll just move forward, meet again in July. I can reach out by email and if anyone would like to, you know, form a subcommittee to talk about things before July, we could do that. And I also wanna thank Victoria Wittig for helping me make the agenda, you know, and think through what we should do today. And I'll be available for um, more input or feedback as a new chair is selected. So just keep me posted. Okay, yeah, and we're looking for a new chair. We're looking for a co-chair for this group. So if anyone feels that um, would be exciting to them, let me know. <laughs> all right, so thank you. Let me thank you. Here. Thanks all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks Laura. Bye-bye. Do you need anything else from me, Laura? No, those look great. Like, thank you so much for doing it. It actually is a huge help. I appreciate it, even though I wasn't no doing problem. it. Um, you did a great job. Um, Perfect. So I have a question for you. I know we're going to yeah. be meeting on Monday, and Maria will be entering her two-week period. Well, she'll, she'll be out. And I think you have a really good handle on the social media stuff. Uh -huh. um, one of the things that is on my task list is to plan the July executive council meeting somewhere like in Wisconsin. Well, it's okay. actually Illinois State, State Beach, Illinois Beach oh, State Park. And I remember I you guys I, talking about um, that at the end of the meeting, yeah. Yeah, I wondered if I were to kind of, kind of connect you with Jim, just to kind of work out the logistics, how would you feel comfortable? Would you feel comfortable with that or you're just sort of oh, I would, yeah, out. I would absolutely love to help with that. Okay. It'd be something I have my I event know. planning minor, so I'm pretty good at a I know. I'm gonna, <laughs> I could put you to good work with that. And that would be something to take off my plate, which would be great. And I think how I look at this is that we would have the you know, the executive council meeting in the morning, probably 10 to 12 again, and then okay. have a presentation. And maybe okay. it would even be like the the meeting wouldn't go quite as long, a presentation and then a site tour, and we'd probably have lunch while the presentation was going. Lunch and networking, it would be a little bit like a field trip, but um, so I'm just stripping it. it. I don't want it. It doesn't need to be. Um, it doesn't need to be like a full day thing, but I think just a presentation and then the opportunity to go on a guided guided walk or something like that. And I'm not even tied to that, like get input okay. from Jim about what he thinks would work. But I think just even if I were to like connect you with him to sort of scope out like what, where, who is the contact at Illinois Beach State Park and um, who would be potential speakers to reach out to about that, that would be great. But we can talk yeah, about okay. that. Absolutely, we can talk about it more Monday, but that sounds great. All right, sounds good. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a great weekend. I hope it, I hope you, uh, hope, Hope all goes well. Yeah, me too. I hope you have a good weekend too. Thank you. Take care. Right. Bye. Bye.